check, mic check. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is a mic check from the sound technician who is inside Americana One. Good morning, guys. Thank you for attending uh, this session on Sunday morning. I think it's a prime time event right now. Uh, I think uh, this is a, a session that the research committee uh, arranged uh, because all of us have a different path to success in terms of uh, research and all of us have a different story. And we have uh, gathered a tremendous uh, lineup of speakers who will give their perspective on various uh, topics and then uh, we are really grateful for the um, senior panelists, uh, Dr. Hughes, um, Susan Orloff, and uh, Dr. Winter uh, to participate in the discussion. I think uh, our format will be, we'll start with the talks and then we'll uh, at the end take a question and answer and have a, a panel discussion. So with that, we'll start with the first talk. The first talk is uh, about how to avoid uh, extension and uh, the first speaker is Dr. Mustafa Rao from City of Hope. He will be presenting uh, virtually. However, the stochastic process of forming translation groups can be efficient. For junior scientists starting their independent research careers, then this inefficiency can be costly. A deliberate effort at creating a research team is possible and requires advanced planning. While every translation surgeon scientist will have to grapple with the set of challenges, certain guiding principles are summarized. By the time surgeons are finishing their clinical training, they've already been exposed to a myriad of challenging clinical scenarios that are screened for solutions. Identifying a research gap that is likely to improve health of the surgical patient is usually not a problem. However, the surgical investigators should feel passionate about finding a solution to the problem. Without an obsessive enthusiasm for the chosen research area, it is unlikely that the quest for a solution will be sustained in the face of disappointing results. It is also imperative that the idea of at least the problem statement be vetted out through feedback from colleagues. Feedback from experienced investigators may not only help refine the problem statement, but may also help determine if the research focus is feasible and aligned to that of funding bodies. When observation is converted to improvement and health of that process is called translation. This requires an intervention. Intervention can be of many different types, and this requires a unique skill set depending on the type of the intervention. So a translational scientist would have multiple different domains of expertise. And I refer to the audience to this uh, really nice paper um, uh, on the NCAT website that illustrates what those skill sets and domains need to be. Once the research focus has been narrowed down, the next step is to refine the problem statement and develop a sales pitch. This is necessary to convince the collaborators and future hires in the lab that the problem you feel passionately about is worth the, their time and effort. Within this context, a translational scientist should define the areas of expertise that may be needed to achieve the solution. Potential collaborators with relevant expertise can be identified with within institution through involvement in seminars, work groups, disease teams, or through word of mouth. It is important not to restrict collaborations to within institution. 
While proximity has advantages, these are less important in current times. Um, NIH Reporter is actually a remarkable resource to search for potential collaborators, both local and distant. Beyond expertise, it is important that the collaborator is 100% on board with the research direction and matches your enthusiasm about the research problem. A track record of team science is a major plus when selecting a collaborator, and past record may predict future team engagement. I can't stress this enough. Hiring the right people for your laboratory is, is essential because it could make or break several years of progress. Every translational research scientist should assemble a team of mentors. Mentorship can come in different flavors and should serve specific purpose. Expertise-based mentors can provide guidance pertaining to a specific task. It is important to have cognitive diversity as tasks required to complete a translational project are diverse. In addition, an adjacent me uh, mentor who is a surgeon scientist in your field can be an invaluable resource. To avoid competition, this should preferably be someone whose area of inquiry is distinct from yours. Tangential mentorship can be provided by established translational scientists in unrelated disciplines. It is important, in, important to gain a wide range of mentorship inputs as you venture into an uncharted territory. It is also important to diversify research strategy. Lack of focus is detrimental, but so is putting all your eggs in one basket. Having gap backup projects and ability to pivot in the face of unexpected results is critical. Once the team is put together, it is important to have regular group meetings. These group meetings should provide a safe and inclusive space for scientific curiosity. No question is a dumb question, and to make progress, everyone in the group must reach common understanding. It is important to state assumptions clearly so everyone in the group can discern when a commonly held belief in the field is rooted in dogma or it is rooted in scientific knowledge. Language immersion on a scientific journey has growing pains, but it is a critical step for the success of the group. While this is mundane, a translational surgeon scientist needs to familiarize themselves with institutional and fe federal regulatory requirements. Some of these are listed here. And timely completion of regulatory steps is essential for uh, effective translational research program. Historically, surgeons have been excellent collaborators being at the helm of resected surgical specimens. While surgeons should continue to take an active role in biobanking and clinical annotation of biorepositories, these resources are increasingly under the purview of institutional biorepositories and core facilities. The role of translational surgeon scientists in a team should extend well beyond involvement in biobanking. To test in interventions and to advance research missions, successful surgeon scientists in recent times have had a strong track record of generating innovative and pertinent disease models, including cell lines, organotypic cultures, and animal models. It is strongly encouraged that junior investigators build the capacity to generate and work with these models relevant to their research in their own laboratory. Not only are surgeons aware of the limitations of these models, but their clinical knowledge is also critical for interpretation of data from these models. This is also an efficient way to attract other collaborations for team science projects. I will leave the audience with these references um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Susan Tsai, who is a professor of surgery and director of the Pancreas Center at uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. I um, sat on the wrong side of the talk. I was going to say. <laughs> I have it on a thumb drive, too, if you need it. Okay. 
Sure. We'll move on uh, with the next speaker, which is uh, Victor Zafuddin. Uh, uh, Victor is an associate professor of surgery at the uh, University of uh, Virginia, and uh, he will talk about how to make uh, your health services research impactful. Good morning. I'd like to thank the HPBA Research Committee for the invitation to talk about a topic that's of personal interest. It's geared a little bit more towards uh, trainees and junior faculty rather than uh, senior members of this audience. Oh, uh, I don't have any disclosures. I think the first uh, question to answer is uh, impactful to whom? If you want to talk about being impactful to the dean of your institution or the central office, that typically means extramural funding. If you are talking about impactful to the PNT committee, that's typically number and volume of work followed by funding, and it's somewhat institution dependent and track dependent. If you talk about impactful to your patients, that's typically practice changes, advances in patient care, and frequently practice changes, advances in patient care are not funded. So, you know, over the last 20 years of going to this meeting, I think you can pick a whole bunch of advances in patient care. I just picked two. Neither of these had R1 funding. Uh, Nick Vote and his group in, you know, describing, defining, quantifying, figuring out how to improve future liver remnant had improved care of all of our liver surgery, extended resection patients, not funded. Uh, Chuck Volmer's uh, work on fistula risk score, quantifying it, defining it, figuring out uh, what components are more important than others, uh, very important, not funded. I promise of clicking the button. Uh, so some of the considerations, and that's again touching base on what Dr. Roof said uh, in a much more extent, but the first thing I think that you gotta do is figure out a topic that's of clinical expertise and of interest to you. And then systematically, methodologically, with pretty good rigor, address that topic. And of course, just to follow that, what is the question? What are you trying to improve? What are the data sources that are applicable that can be used to address that question? Is this an exploratory question or is there an intervention? Uh, if there is an intervention, how do you measure that intervention? Or is it applicable across different patient populations, different institutions, different countries? A good example of that while I'm clicking this button is uh, watching PVE through uh, form through the IMV, which nobody in this country would do uh, with regularity. So in terms of data sources, I think, uh, you know, when people say health services research, it's automatically assumed that it's uh, registries. And whether you're talking about SEER, NCDB, NISQIP, you know, SENIS, there are tons of registries. They're very powerful tools for testing some associations between patients. And another great thing about them is research can be performed really by anybody with uh, clinical and methodological expertise and anywhere, including at the beach. However, the analyses are frequently hypothesis generating rather than addressing a specific patient need because testing interventions is either challenging or just frankly impossible. So with that, typically institutional, multi-institutional collaborations are more likely to provide granular data into test interventions. And these can be certainly retrospective uh, and uh, as long as there's a control group or they can be even better prospective, but prospective studies, as we all know, are very challenging. They're consuming, they're resource intensive. Uh, you know, most of this work, as I discussed, doesn't really have federal funding. So it's hard to get, uh, you know, clinical uh, CRCs paid for. So again, since I was thinking of different audience, you know, just a little bit of a personal perspective, I'm really a pretty busy clinical surgeon, and this is without all these things we do to buy down time. You know, I've never been federally funded. I have been supported by the department as well as the Cancer Center, including the American Cancer Society grants that are institutional. I have personal interest in patient-centered outcomes and patient selection as it applies to the operations we all do. 
uh, and I partner extensively both within the department as well as within institutional resources. And institutional resources will vary from place to place, but you can usually find collaborators, whether it's in a cancer center, in a public health sciences uh, division, or somewhere similar to provide you help with um, uh, data collection, such as quality nurses or uh, cancer center registrars and biostatisticians. Uh, we work a lot with residents and students, and we are grateful to have a T32 Surgical Oncology Grant in which uh, if you're not funded, you can be an associate member. If you're funded, you're a uh, mentor. Uh, students, typically many of us fund from clinical revenue. And when we started out, we really started like many folks start out by using big data. Uh, so we did SEER, NIS, NISQA projects, and these are good to uh, generate hypotheses and test associations and figure out how different populations do. And really, you know, beginning Tim Newhook, uh, who's now a staff at Anderson and Ali Martin, who's graduating from uh, Anderson as a senior fellow, have really pushed those projects forward. As we evolved a little bit and we had a little bit more time to put together some more granular databases, uh, we started looking at uh, longer outcomes, so one, two, five-year outcomes, testing some, or retrospectively looking at some interventions and care pathways. And that work has been done by student, uh, by current residents. Uh, Samia was a student, but Courtney's a resident. Uh, and then as we are continuing to evolve, we now have a prospective measurement of uh, quality of life measures, uh, which we prospectively study in clinic, again, driven by residents. So in terms of questions, everybody usually struggles with questions. I think if you just step foot in this meeting, you know, there are so many talks in transplant oncology, very few data, a lot of opportunities for those of you who are institutions who do it. Uh, every time I come to this meeting, I hear the same hepatic arterial infusion talks. Dr. Litsky is right there. We are all looking forward to your data. Very timely for you to sit here. I'd love to see some data that's not from Memorial. And then I hated to put together a slide deck that doesn't have any pictures. Uh, this is a patient with a completely blown, that blown out main duct IPMN with a solid component, mucin all through the duodenum. The entire gland is a rock, huge gland, uh, vein involvement, uh, big operation. All of us have do it. Uh, the entire gland is low grade dysplasia with a few foci of intermediate dysplasia. We still don't know so much about what we do every day that there's no shortage of questions. That's all I have. We'll go back to Dr. Susan Tsai. As I mentioned, she's a professor of surgery and a director of the pancreas uh, cancer program at uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. All right, great. Um, so my only disclosure is uh, everything I'm gonna talk about is my experience as a surgical oncologist. Um, okay, so uh, for the very many people in this room, <laughs> we realize that uh, there's an issue with the plight of the surgeon scientist. And um, there's many editorials and, and uh, publications about this, which I've listed here and I encourage you to read. Um, a summary of some of the issues are in the table on the I guess that's your right side. Um, and they can be at an individual level, whether it's financial um, in terms of paying back student loans, it's, it's institutional. Um, and this is primarily kind of the focus has been on an increase in patient care demands, especially specifically with uh, RVU based compensations or increased administrative obligations. And so all of this in total has really resulted in a decrease in the number of NIH applications and decreased rates of funding for surgeon scientists. And so um, surgeons that are um, in particular HPB surgeons, I think are especially disadvantaged here, where unlike our colleagues, we are really asked to be high volume surgeons. There's this volume outcome relationship. And unlike medical oncologists or our medicine colleagues who can be on service for blocks of time and then have a lot of uninterrupted uh, research time, we oftentimes are seeing patients uh, every day, if not every week. So especially challenging. So um, with all these threats, including excessive clinical duties, uh, competitive funding environment, and then um, especially the increasing 
uh, specialization of um, science. So it's the rate at which science is um, rapidly adapting now. It's very difficult for one laboratory to be able to do all components necessary. Um, and so that actually increases the, the gap between the clinician and the researcher. Um, that really places us at uh, quite a bit of a disadvantage. And so I think when we think about extinction, we, we often think about dinosaurs. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And we think that dinosaurs obviously um, are extinct because they could not adapt to their environment. And so one question I just want to pose for everyone is to how can we specifically adapt a little bit better to our own environments? Um, and so for me, when I think about this, um, I think a lot of the editorials that I read emphasize the burden of uh, patient care demands and administrative obligations on surgeon scientists. And then I think there's a way to maybe flip that narrative so that you can leverage some of these burdens to potentially become assets. And um, when you think about the definition of a basic scientist for National uh, Science Foundation, they often say that this is... Um, the pursuit of knowledge for the sake of knowledge. It's not necessarily with a particular application or use in mind. And so I think most surgeon scientists do not fit that classic definition. I, I, there's very few surgeon scientists that I know uh, that are not looking for um, some change that really will reflect in patient care. Um, and, and we definitely are people of action as well. So I think this quote, and it's hard to see, but this is from Leonardo da Vinci when he says that, you know, there is an urgency of doing, and I think that's very true of surgeons, and that knowing is not enough. So when I think about uh, kind of the challenges of surgeon scientists, I think that we have an opportunity to build a second lab, and that's a clinical lab. So what I mean by that is, we have an opportunity to leverage what makes us very different from basic scientists and create a different platform to complement our basic science work. So that inquiry car is creating a clinical framework, developing a team, and then uh, developing some resources around that. So I'll just briefly go over that. Um, so with regards to um, clinic, uh, clinical framework, I think all of us want to impact um, each patient that we see, we want to learn from every patient. And especially in some of the diseases that we're studying, they're quite rare. So we want to capture every single patient that goes through the door and study them in a systematic way, just as we would in a laboratory. And it makes sense to have a standardization of clinical pathways in that sense. So there is consensus about stage and treatment. And even though I may not see every pancreatic cancer that comes through MCW, I know that there may be changes in the way we treat people longitudinally in blocks, but within um, the providers, the treatment is the same. So there's some standardization there. Um, obviously, we have to measure the exposures of interest, whether that be tumor markers and measuring them at the appropriate time, whether that's um, patient reported outcomes, all that can be captured longitudinally. And endpoints of interest, of course, very specific to what you're looking for. For oncology, obviously, it's completion of treatment and, and the impact on survival. Um, I do think that it's important when you think about building your team, and this is reflecting what Mustafa was saying, um, you have to bring everybody along. So in just the same way that you build your research team, maybe on the basic science side, you have to think about your collaborators on the clinical side as well and be inclusive in authorship. A lot of them are looking also at their promotion, their rank and tenure um, applications. And this is another way to just build um, team, uh, a team mentality and support others who are um, contributing to your research. So I think when I was like a late, early to mid career person, um, a very wise surgeon scientist said to me, you know, basic scientists, they really want two things from surgeons. They either want money or they want tissue. And I think that's actually pretty accurate um, in my experience. I hope it's not accurate for everybody, but in my experience, it has been. So I do think that building a biorepository, and this is a common theme from uh, Mustafa's talk as well, is, is really valuable. Um, and I do think that it's important that surgeons control these tissues. These patients, um, we put a lot of time into the treatment of these patients, and it only makes sense that we um, have control over what they're used for. Um, the things that I think we can especially um, identify or contribute to is who to bank, so that we're very specific on who we're studying, when we bank them, is there an associated CT scan, is this at a special clinical time point, or what are we banking? If we're interested in cyst, do we do cyst fluid? 
um, pancreatic juices? Are we banking stool, uh, urine, blood, those kinds of things? And how to process and store these specimens correctly? So you have to have some concept of what you want to do with these in the future. For example, cell-free DNA, you can't just bank the plasma. You have to process it a certain way. And of course, that allows you to control when it's released, whether that's to industry, whether that's to a collaborator, whether it's for your own research. Um, I think Mustafa talked about um, developing derivatives, also very, very important. And finally, I think what makes this really, really special um, is to link that with clinical data. So that's um, a very, very valuable resource once you have a well annotated um, biorepository. Um, and so I think um, when you think about your clinical lab, kind of the best clinical lab experiment is a clinical trial. Um, and so, you know, if you look at Bernie Fisher, you Google Bernie Fisher, he's listed in Wikipedia as a scientist, um, but, you know, he's known for his clinical trials. So when you look at um, clinical trials, I think, again, the value, and I'm sorry, I kind of missed this on my other slides, but when you think about the value, the value of clinical trials is to the patients, it, there's um, value to the clinical practice. People will travel for a clinical trial. P your institution will be known for clinical trials and then for the research program as well. Um, surgeons have an, a unique opportunity, I think, to look at their clinical trial portfolio and make sure that there is a clinical trial available for anyone who comes through the door. Not everybody can um, contribute to a clinical trial, but it, at least they have something available to them. Um, similarly, for those people who cannot participate in a cl clinical trial, they can participate in the biorepository, hopefully. Um, and obviously your secondary endpoints would reinforce your, your clinical interest, or sorry, translational interest, and actually may need to lead to new questions. And this came up at the clinical trial um, symposium yesterday. I actually think that pre and post biopsies are incredibly important and we should be doing them. All right, so um, in summary, I don't think that um, surgeons are dinosaurs, which I think of having small brains and being cold blooded. I'm not sure they're quite pandas either. <laughs> Um, but I do think that the future is a little bit brighter than what people think. Um, I do think there's an opportunity, at least what's worked um, for me and my experiences, to actually develop this complementary clinical laboratory, even though I don't call it a clinical lab, um, but to think about it in a similar way. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Adil Khan, who is an associate professor of surgery in the section of transplant uh, at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And he will be talking about how to make uh, your health services research impactful. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to uh, talk. Um, so my talk is going to be uh, following Victor's talk on how to make health services research impactful. Um, so disclosure, I am a proctor uh, for Intuitive Surgical, and part of my talk is going to be um, talking about our robotic experience, so it's pertinent. So I am a transplant and HPV surgeon um, on the clinical track. Uh, my academic interests are robotic transplant and HPV and surgical training, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, in this talk, I'll give a little bit of overview of health services research on my take for it. And again, it builds up on what you've already heard today. And uh, then we'll conclude with a little bit about our personal experience with uh, the impact of health services research and our journey in robotic transplantation. So what is health services research? So briefly, it's dis uh, translating discovery and research into practice and policy. Um, you know, we are all familiar with basic uh, science research and how uh, the study of biology, physiology, pathology can be translated to developing interventions, uh, initially looking at safety and efficacy. And then the next step of that, which is the translation of uh, research from basic health sciences into larger populations is uh, health services research. Uh, in a nutshell, it deals with effectiveness and efficiency of medical intervention. And, you know, as you can imagine, it can include a whole uh, host of uh, uh, things. The overall goal for all research is to improve patient and population health. And I think it's important to, to keep that in mind, especially when dealing with industry and things like that. Um, so there are a lot of tools that are available that can uh, uh, be used for health services research, and every tool has a place, um, depending on what the question is and what you're trying to answer. So we all know randomized trials, analysis, uh, 
uh, institutional databases or national databases, and then, uh, you know, administrative claims data, quality of life studies, economic assessment, and decision modeling and policy. And all those are all different aspects um, of um, health services research, depending on what question we are looking to answer. So I think it's also important to talk about what is impactful, right? So I think there's no doubt in anybody's mind that uh, the that, uh, biggest impact we are looking for from research is uh, on patient and population health. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that uh, a little bit of the impact uh, that we are looking for is for our own professional growth, especially if you're a young surgeon starting in this day and time, I think to develop a niche and to develop an academic career does take a little bit of a priority as well as long as it is behind the bigger goal, which is to uh, positively impact patient and population health. So how to make your research impactful? Victor covered a lot of this. First thing is to ask the right question, and that can be a lot harder. I mean, it. Uh, I couldn't really figure out how to ask the right question before I realized that uh, you know a lot of it comes with experience and with expertise in one particular field. Um, recognizing a problem is easier once you've had some time doing something, because then you can figure see what areas you need to improve on. Um, so with uh, developing a niche or having a small area of focus definitely helps. Uh, it's important to ask uh, to make sure that the question is relevant, timely, and unique, because those things are what will get noticed. If it's already been done, then there's really not too much point in repeating it. Um, the study design needs to be very thoughtful. I think uh, it's very important because the question can be great, but if you don't design the study properly, you may not get the answers that you're looking for. The design has to be appropriate. Methodology has to be solid. Objectives need to be clear. Uh, needs to have well-defined endpoints that are realistic and easy to measure. It's also important to have a good understanding of resource availability and utilization, you know, how to access data. It's good to have a data manager. Um, statistics support is important. I think it's important that we learn some statistics too, but I think having somebody with a more advanced analysis definitely helps, especially if you don't have much research background, as I did not. Um, it's important to have an understanding of the fundings and the grants that are available and, you know, the different uh, categories and uh, you might be applicable to those. It's always good to look into them. If you're not familiar with them, as many clinical surgeons are not, it's good to talk to some of the colleagues who gave the talks earlier and, and, and get a good understanding of that because those can be really helpful. Um, industry support, right? So that's always a little complicated and a bit controversial. You know, of course, there's a huge conflict of interest, but you know, the bottom line is that industry does make a lot of what we do possible, right? A lot of the things that we use on a daily basis come from industry. So I think that it, 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 it can be a very important partnership if used and done properly. Uh, it can be an important source of funding. However, like I said, there is a big conflict of interest and one needs to be very cognizant of that. Uh, for me, the, I think that you know, before partnering with any industry, uh, you need to ask yourself and you need to really believe in the product. So if you believe in the product, then it's okay. But if you don't believe in the product and just partnering for, for other gains, um, I think that that's where, uh, that's a slippery slope. So patient health should always take priority over financial or any other gains when dealing with industry, in my opinion. Um, Multi-institutional collaborations and partnerships are another um, uh, area where it can make research impactful. And then one have to be cognizant that things change, right? So there might be something that you might be working on for years and all of a sudden something comes up that, that either proves it or negates it. And then you have to be sort of willing to just move on and, and not let it bother you too much and change direction. Yeah, I mean, stubbornness helps only to a point. Um, so for me personally, I think that, that, that that's a big lesson. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of conclude a little bit with uh, with how we use health services research um, uh, in our academic journey in robotic transplantation. So that's my area of interest. It's a very new field. I mean, and even in HPB, it's relatively new, but it's brand new in transplant. There's really no data almost. It's, uh, um, it's uh, it, you know, there are few programs doing it. So I thought this was an area that was unique and was an opportunity for me to develop a niche. So I focused a lot of my research in this. Um, you know, we are a very new robotic transplant program. It started just a few years ago. As you can see, you now it was pretty low volume uh, uh, in 2018, 2019. And of course, there were there were you know a lot of problems as a lot of us have experienced. 
And the question that I asked was, okay, so how can we grow and build the program, right? And the challenges, of course, there were the logistical challenges. It's hard to get time on the robot. But I th we thought that the biggest challenge was that we didn't really have a dedicated robotic transplant team. And unlike, unlike other specialties where you can rely on somebody that you've never worked before to help you, many of the transplant things are time sensitive. You need somebody who you can trust. And we thought that that was a big shortcoming in, in the current uh, transplant structure of uh, robotic programs. So what we uh, proposed was that we need to develop a dedicated team that had people with expertise in both robotics and in transplantation. And we said, you know, we're gonna invest heavily in this. We um, assigned a team leader. We completely trained our own bedside assistant so we didn't have to develop uh, to rely on anyone. We even trained scrub techs and circulating nurses had a curriculum, went, went the whole nine yards. It was a huge undertaking. Um, we were fortunate to have support and we did that. And what we also, did was we also developed our own robotic transplant database. So we were following all the outcomes for all of the cases we were doing, uh, specifically for clinical growth and outcomes, operative efficiency, team building, uh, cost, and uh, fellow education and edu uh, training, which was a big part of what we what we do. So you know, we the best part about this was this was an this was a completely open playing field is almost non-existent data. So, you know, we looked at our experience with program building and we were productive. We kind of, you know, published a lot on a lot of these features. So program growth and clinical outcomes was another area where we just for every single procedure, we because we had a database, we could just kind of keep on uh, generating data, which was uh, previously uh, very limited or, or, or didn't exist. Um, we invested heavily in fellow education and training because we thought that that was the future. We believed in robotics. So we um, uh, did a lot of uh, uh, you know, training into how to get them more efficient. And, and we were able to publish heavily on that. The fellows were very interested in it and they were extremely productive. And this, uh, this uh, changed a lot of the uh, policies for other programs as well. Uh, we talked a lot about learning curves uh, for not just for surgeons, uh, early in the career, but also for trainees. And, um, and, uh, and of course, surgical technique, because uh, you know what we were finding that the more we did, the more we could do things that weren't done previously. So it was an opportunity to really talk about uh, how to do different things. And, um, and, uh, and, and that was a lot of fun, but also very productive too. Um, also, we published for standardization of training, which is something that we are really focusing on right now. So, uh, and of course, then cost and efficiency. We worked on that to how we can decrease costs for robotics and how we can make the processes more efficient. Um, you know, worked on grants. We did partnership with industry, and we thought that was pretty helpful. Um, and how did this impact us? So just because of that team, our numbers just went. I mean, they, our program really grew, and and I. And I do think that the research that we did in team building and the investment that we did paid off in that regard. Just in like a three or four years of program volume has grown to where we're the, one of the largest robotic programs in the country. Um, I mean, these talk a little bit about how our numbers of cases have gone up, but I think the most important thing where um, I personally am more proud of is that the fellows are participating a lot more. So they come to almost uh, two thirds of the cases and when they do come, 94% of the time they're actually operating. And to me, that, that, that was always our goal. And, and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, I think that it was just building the team and the research that made it possible. Similarly, we're doing a lot more complex cases, which means we can serve our population better. We can do things minimally invasively that we couldn't do better, and we can impact uh, patient and population health. And uh, if you look at the different categories, I think that just having this uh, uh, team and developing this program and doing the research uh, allowed us to hit all of these areas. So if you talk about patient health, we could be showed that uh, there were improved outcomes even compared to laparoscopy for a lot of the procedures. We expanded our own indications. Uh, we started offering the patients to more complex living donors and kidneys uh, for more obese patients who are donors or recipients. And uh, we could be sure that we could do it with a lower morbidity. So it allowed us to build our living donor kidney program. Uh, once we started doing more and we got attention, the hospital became more supportive and all the resources we weren't getting earlier, we started getting them. Uh, we got more block time visibility and a lot of our initiatives got implemented um, hospital-wide. So it brought a lot of notice to our transplant team. Um, fellowship, we talked a little bit about that, but it allowed us to really structure our training, 
give the fellows an additional skill set. It increased the demand for fellows looking to train with us, but also the marketability of the fellows that we have trained. And the last few fellows have all started robotic programs in their own uh, new programs, which has been great to see. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the national leadership, which again, we said was a small byproduct of the reason why we do it, but it's an important byproduct. Um, you know, we, we've become a probably the only uh, approved case observation site. We've mentored over 20 programs all over the country in developing robotic programs. And we've started many collaborative efforts and partnerships across the country, which is great for, for making connections and for networking. And it lays the foundation for other research projects as well. So in conclusion, I mean, health services research is an important part of what we do as uh, clinical surgeons. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to do. Uh, I think it's hard to get the resources sometimes, but we put the work in early. In my view, there are a lot of options and avenues that open up, which can allow you to do a lot of things with, with a high degree of success. And, you know, of course, with the main goal of impacting patient care, but at the same time, for a younger surgeon, it can play a key role in developing a niche and developing an academic career. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Michelle Babicki, who is a surgeon scientist at the Oregon Clinic, and she will be talking about what Dr. Susan Sai earlier on alluded to, how to balance clinical practice and research. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present. I have no financial disclosures. Um, today, I'd like to share with you some of my philosophy about really navigating rather than balancing a clinical practice and research. Share some of the tips and tricks I've learned to be successful um, with the caveat that we all struggle with this. Um, I like this quote, there's no such thing as work-life balance, it's all life. The balance has to be within you. Um, and I like to throw this slide up a lot because this is really my North Star. Um, clinical excellence always comes first, but you have to balance your research and educational missions um, and, they, and give them equal importance um, and try to overlap them as much as possible and align your efforts with your clinical practice um, so that you can focus as much as possible and be productive and successful. So philosophically, why is research important? Um, it's how we communicate as professionals. It's how we measure our outcomes. It's how we think, think critically about challenging problems and how we innovate and develop solutions for those problems. And importantly, it's how we improve the lives of our patients. I don't know how you can do this work and walk into a patient's room with pancreas cancer or cholangiocarcinoma or metastatic colon cancer every day and not be doing something to try and improve their situation. Um, so it gives them hope, it gives them something to look forward to, and it gives us promise for the future. And you have to think about why research is important to you. What are you passionate about? Know your values and your vision for your career. And take the time, I spend a lot of time thinking about this, to regularly look at it and write it down and make sure that what you are doing every day in your day-to-day -day work is driving your vision forward. And if it's not, then you need to change something. You can be really creative about the types of research you do, and I'm not going to rattle off all of these types of research that everybody's interested in, but I think it's great to hear about all the innovative projects that people are doing that are outside of traditional lab work. Um, but it's important to just be creative, find out what your strengths are in your institution, and really leverage those strengths. What do you see a lot in your clinical practice? What challenges do you face on a regular basis? What are the strengths of your institution, and how can you get involved and contribute? For example, I picked my job because I knew on the second floor, two floors down from my office, it was gonna be an immune oncology lab working on pancreas cancer and cholangio. And that was in complete alignment with my basic science background and what I wanted to do. Um, we have a really busy liver cancer clinic. We see a high volume of HCC and work really closely with some talented IR docs and hepatologists. This is a great opportunity to do research for this patient population. And we have a really high volume of necrotizing pancreatitis. Now, I'm not particularly interested in pancreatitis, but my fellow was. And so we developed a quality initiative grant and a project looking at how to optimize the management of these patients and get them triaged more appropriately. So be curious. I think it's a really challenging healthcare environment right now, and it's really easy to perseverate on all the challenges we face every day. Um, but I liked this that I came across as I was reading for this talk. Keep research in your thoughts. 
try to focus your attention and your energy on things that are productive and make things move forward and be innovative. This is probably my most important slide, protect your time. You need solid blocks of quality time, um, preferably at the beginning of the week. For the last couple of years, I was trying to do research on Thursday after I did two major cases, Monday and Tuesday, and a full clinic on Wednesday, and I was completely useless <laughs> on Thursday. So I switched that. I'm starting in January. I have my entire Mondays completely protected. Um, and when I say protected, I mean it. You know, I, I coordinated schedules with my collaborators, so I have time to work with them. I have a quiet space to focus and work. Um, my office is in my clinic. I can get nothing done there. So I set up a separate office and work from there. Um, ask and negotiate for what you need. Um, set deadlines and goals. Minimize your interruptions and leave perfectionism behind. I think something that's really hindered me early um, was just trying to iterate and iterate and iterate and make it perfect, make it better. But at some point, you got to just cut the strings and get it out um, and move on to the next project. Build a team around you that shares your values. Um, it's important that if you're going to take this time to do these research projects, that the people around you are going to cover for you. They're going to cover the clinical responsibilities. We hired an NP. She has been amazingly helpful, and she helps triage all of the clinical stuff that's going on when I'm not in the office. Develop a system to keep up with your clinical paperwork. You don't want this stuff hanging over your head while you're trying to focus on some other project. Um, I hired a scribe to write all my clinic notes. That is not a good use of my time to reiterate all this stuff into a note, um, and, and she makes that a lot more efficient. I have fellows who manage my patients on the floor. I don't need to micromanage, you know, electrolytes and fluids. They are fully capable of doing that, so I let them handle the patients, um, and I'm strict about it. No phone calls, no patient visits, no admin fires on my days that I'm trying to do projects. Be selective about who and what you give your time and energy to. Prioritize, I'm terrible at this. Everything is always on the same priority level, but you've got to triage and get some projects done before you start initiating other ones. Delegate projects to your trainees and engage them often to make sure that they're still interested in it, still going to get it done um, and get it across the finish line. And be efficient with your time and respect the time of others. Follow through on the things you say you're going to do and really focus on meaningful work. Thank you very much for your attention. Our next and last speaker is uh, Dr. Alex Ganji, who is the director of the Gastrointestinal Tumor Program and Cancer Regional Therapies Program at Cedar sinai Thank you for having me speak today <clears throat> and good morning. Um, so how to balance clinical practice and research. I have no relevant financial disclosures and uh, I do not know the answer to this question. In fact, when I got the invitation, my chief resident was walking with me and they said, he said, they asked you to talk about what balance you. And I said, yes, what's the problem? And he said, you're here later than all of us all the time. <laughs> you don't know anything about balance. And I said, okay, well, thank you. So, uh, we're going to do a, a pictorial discussion about my opinions regarding balance. So this is the idea, blue skies, everything is perfectly balanced. There's an ocean in the background, um, but this is the reality. Um, there's essentially rocks falling from the sky and you're trying to dodge them at any given point. Fortunately, this gentleman is still standing. Um, so I think, I think the goal here is really to understand that you can have balance, um, but sometimes it doesn't necessarily feel that way. Uh, after receiving my DOD grant, uh, we discussed essentially having 50% protected time. And if you actually look at this carefully, it's really not a total of 50%. Um, with uh, research time being blocked out for Thursdays and Fridays, and Dr. Babicki alluded to this, you're essentially dead by Thursday and Friday roll around. Uh, we used to block out Thursday and Friday in gray, and I really think my assistants just, they don't see gray. They don't, they just, it didn't matter. Um, but we changed it to this red thing on top, and this is still my schedule. These are the last three weeks of my life. Um, this week was actually a little bit better. We were able to block things out and then we went back to operating essentially every day and adding on patients and clinic and whatever else. The reality is it's your job to protect your time. It's nobody else's. So, um, what Dr. Babiki alluded to in terms of, um, you know, you have to have no, uh, no interruptions. People are going to call you. Patients are going to need to see you. Patients are going to be ill. 
um, but it's important for you to block out that time if it matters. So what does it really take for balance? It takes hard work and it takes a lot of hustle. Um, and if you want to be successful, then that's what you have to do. So um, for success as a surgeon scientist, there's a few important components if you're considering doing that. You have to have a supportive environment. You have to have a department with a track record of success, available resources, facilities, equipment, protected time, which again, it can be promised, but you have to do the job of actually making sure that it's protected. If you're going to be working in a lab, either your own lab or someone else's, you have to have lab space and access to collaborators and collaboration. You have to have committed mentors. Um, I put this picture in here because you really have to have someone who is invested in your growth. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have in the lab a uh, mentor who uh, is available basically 24 hours a day, Sundays, nights, post-op, it doesn't matter when, um, reaches out, makes sure everything is happening and we're able to meet and go through all of this. Um, it's not just someone who's available from nine to five and I can't stress the importance of that as someone who's trying to start their research career. You also have a network of mentors who can provide other skill sets uh, and someone who's an experienced investigator because we don't know it all and I think we're all constantly learning. Additionally, you have to have from an institution financial support. Um, you have to have a competitive salary that values your contributions. A lot of us will get a startup package after receiving funding though. The institution expects you to continue getting additional funding, which is difficult. We've alluded to that a few times. And you have to have achievable benchmarks. So you have to get, if there are VU targets, you have to meet them. And if there's other, other targets that you have to meet as well, you have to figure that out. In order to have any balance whatsoever though, you also need social support. You need the support of your family and friends, work-life integration, and you also have to have realistic expectations. So can you have your cake and eat it too? Uh, perhaps you can also fall asleep in your cake if you're really tired, but um, there really, in my opinion, is no substitute for hard work other than maybe harder work. Uh, and there's times, uh, there's give and take when this can happen. We talk about resilience and grit and, and all of these things. And I think in talking to my trainees, when asking, you know, how is, how is this something that we're going to be able to do? I just say, you know, just recognize that you may have a goal or a vision of, of who and what you ultimately want to become, but it's really important for you to manage that and manage your personal energy. Sometimes you have to shift, right? And you have to be able to say that, okay, this is the, this is what I wanted to do and it's just not working out that way for any potential reason. And you have to be able to shift and find your sense of purpose. That's the kind of important component of resilience. It's not a matter of not quitting and, you know, keep going. Um, so, you know, if you feel like you can't do it, you just have to cut off the T uh, and maybe there's something else that you can do better. Um, Dr. Babicki alluded to perfection. Uh, this is the formula for perfection. I'm bit not very good at math and definitely I have no idea what this equation is, but sometimes as she said, you just have to get it done. You can't always strive for perfect. Um, and this is my opinion of balance. It's uh, rainbows and unicorns. Um, I think this quote really hits it, hits it on the head. Uh, being a surgeon scientist is a lot like playing a game of Tetris. All of the pieces have to fit together. You have to rotate them into position and you can't stop them from dropping no matter what. If you don't get it all just right, your work continues to build up. And as you progress, things get harder, not easier, and everything comes at you faster. So the reward for playing the game is that you get to keep playing. So in conclusion, my opinions about how to balance clinical practice and research, find something that you have a genuine interest in and something that you love. Uh, we all love taking care of patients. That's why a majority went into this, and that's where we get a majority of our clinical questions. Um, so it's important to find something that you enjoy doing. You have to identify mentors who are going to support you and invest in you. You have to be realistic about what you can and cannot do. And you have to be flexible. You're not going to have perfect balance all the time. It's a game of give and take. Sometimes you need more clinical time. Other times you're going to need more research time when grants are due. I can promise you that that schedule is blocked. You also have to schedule time for yourself for purposes of your own mental health. And if you really want it, you have to work harder. That's it. I would like to invite the speakers and the panelists to the um, stage and uh, It's unfortunate, you know, the timing of uh, this conference, but what six great talks, you know, I think uh, for the audience, especially the younger uh, investigators, I think uh, what's unique about 
is that all six of them have di different path to success. So there's no, you know, single pathway to success. I think all of them have a different story and uh, um, of being successful. I had to knock out, you know, Alan Sung. So please feel free to uh, ask any questions from uh, this uh, tremendous uh, panelists and uh, speakers. I want this to be interactive. Um, I will get started. And my question is for Dr. Orloff, uh, Dr. Hughes, and Dr. Winter, is when you guys are recruiting, and especially with now the economic conditions are changing at all the medical centers and most of the big medical centers, you know, are struggling financially. How do you justify funding uh, new faculty who wants to do research? It's a great question, <laughs> and um, I don't think there's any right answer. I think there's a couple different types of people you can recruit. You can recruit people that already have funding, and so they bring their grant with them and their people with them that are there for, for instance, uh, their lab or um, their um, clinical uh, collaborators or research collaborators. I think the other thing that uh, you have to start out with is uh, if, if that's an interest for your institution and for you as a leader, as a chief or a section chief or a department chair, whatever have you, um, you really have to give people a chance, but you have to give them and resources, but you have to give them a finite period of time. I recruited a faculty member and I gave him my lab for two years and I gave him X amount of money to get seed money to get started. And two years went by. He never set foot in the lab and he didn't have any funding and he didn't have any projects. So at that point, you have to say, I think, um, you know, you're really not um, suited for this and probably isn't your path forward. So I think you can't just count on endless amount of resources and endless amount of support financially for someone that doesn't uh, you know, from the start at least you know given the amount of time and you have to set i think that up ahead of time so they know okay i have two years whether it be two years three years whatever and um, if it doesn't happen you really can't continue to support that aspect of their um, job it doesn't mean you fire them it just means you have to steer them in another direction Thank you. So, you know, I, you have to remind the university what their mission is. The 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 mission of of the institution that I work at is to heal, to teach, and to discover. And uh, and and right now they're really just focused on healing, and not discovery. You have to remind them this is part of the mission. And the one of the ingredients of any successful leader is to be able to mobilize resources. When you are recruiting somebody, um, you ha number one, you as the recruiter have to know what kind of resources, what magnitude of resources are going to be required for that person to be successful. And we really shouldn't hire people without getting those resources in place because it's so difficult. And then you have to be a really good negotiator for that person. You're negotiating for them. You can't expect them to negotiate for themselves. So uh, it, it takes a lot of work and you have to be sometimes very creative in, in securing those resources from multiple sources. Um, but I, I think it it's something that we all have to realize is, is a big part of our job is to just secure resources for people. The, the, the easiest time to do it is when you yourself are negotiating for a retention package or a new job, get those resources in place so you don't have to continue to ask every time because that could be very difficult. Jordan, just can I ask a question about that? Because I think even in a contract or when you have something on paper, 
what if your institution doesn't follow through? You know, they, they recruit you and they say you're going to have X amount of money, X amount of resources, and then they don't follow through. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you deal with that? I'm just curious. Yeah, no, I, I, I've I've seen that and have been burned by that. So I know exactly what you're talking about. It's really sad. And uh, um. I, I think as best as we can, it's trying to get those dollars into an account when that deal is made that can't be touched and that um, doesn't erode with the next budget year if it's unspent. That that's the that's the goal, and it's not always achievable, especially now. But I think knowing that that's the goal, um, and knowing that there's the risk of losing that, I think we just have to try and push for that. I I, I agree, Susan. It's it's a big risk. Yeah, in my experience, one of the things that administrators that sign those contracts are really good at is not putting a deadline on it. You know, it's a concept, but not necessarily by this particular date. And so it's yeah, I'll get to it. Um, you know, it's a cash flow thing. But when I recruit somebody, I, I, I look for passion, most importantly, because I think that's what gets the day done. And I think we heard that consistently through all of the talks this morning. Um, and then I remind the administration that the reason that we are successful as an uh, academic health center and why we're different than the rest is because the ability to pursue that passion is done here, not elsewhere. So as soon as you forget that and get focused on just the dollar, uh, you're going to lose why people come to work for the University of Florida in my particular circumstance. I mean, we have better faculty than the community hospital does across town because our faculty are intrinsically curious. They want to challenge the standard of care, which I think is what defines an academic surgeon in some way. They want to do it better next time. Um, and that passion is what I look for when I recruit, whether it's a peer clinician who's going to write some good clinical papers or whether it's somebody that really has the a, uh, an aspiration to have a wet lab. And what I really look for is that alignment with a passion, you know, a, a, an itch that can't be adequately scratched. <laughs> I think uh, continuing on that theme, um, it has happened to all of us, especially in terms of like uh, having database managers, you know, or someone who will help with the biobanking and stuff. But I think from an administrative standpoint, it becomes really difficult to ask for a dedicated salary for those positions. And hence, we had that session on how to make your health services research impactful. If you guys can talk about, you know, how to get resources, because to be successful, whether it's large databases, you still need someone who can procure the data, clean it up, analyze it. Um, So it's open for the whole panel. My turn to go first. So I'll tell you this, I've kept a wet lab alive for 25 years without ever getting an R01. Um, The first thing I would tell you all to do is don't underestimate a grateful patient, get to know your development officer. Um, And then my best advice is, is that what is really powerful with these kind of folks is to get them committed to helping you train somebody. Um, That is a return on investment that uh, these kind of folks really appreciate. And so I have funded residents in the lab for the last 10 years through grateful patients um, in excess of what a T32 would pay. And um, I have brought those patients to come see our research day to actually watch these folks develop and what they're watching happen is a return on their investment that somebody's going to devote their entire career to the disease that they lost a loved one to or, or that they're actively fighting. So that would be my best advice there. And then the second thing is that I took my lab out uh, to celebrate about three months ago. We put our 1,000, 1,000 pancreatic cancer into our, our minus 70. Um, and so I, I heard that repetitively here as well. Don't underestimate your access to humans, your patients, and their and their tissues, and your understanding of how they've suffered. Um, Merck's giving me $150,000 for 20 pancreatic cancer specimens, which is three years of somebody in the lab and I can do it in about six weeks. I think, uh, Dr. Hughes, you bring a great point. And I had the same thing uh, when I, you know, I moved to Vanderbilt, you know, one of my, my third patient that I did a HIPEC on, he's still alive, knock on wood. And at a five-year mark, you know, when uh, I saw him and the scans were clear, he asked me, what can I do for you? And it was really awkward for me to ask because I've never done it. And I think uh, as physicians and surgeons, it's really hard for ask for money. But I did say that, you know, look, this kind of research is not easily funded. 
and we want to make a difference. And uh, luckily for me, you know, he started having these concerts at the famous Bluebird Cafe, and it has actually helped my lab take off, which was struggling without any funding. So I think the importance of, you know, philanthropic support cannot be underestimated. Vic, you were going to say something? Let me just follow up on one thing, and this is a wonderful story. So Ted Copeland, who I think everybody just knows and loves, um, uh, I was first the Cracciolo professor back in 2010. He went down to see Sam Cracciolo with the intent to ask for about $50,000. He brought a development officer along. He walked away with a million dollars. Um, so that's why I'm saying get to know your development officer. Let them do that heavy lifting. Let them do that ask. But it, don't underestimate what these people are interested in doing for you and let them let them negotiate that stuff. So Ted taught me that very valuable lesson. To go back a little bit to your question and not touch on development, uh, which I do agree is incredibly important. Uh, when we were trying to figure out how to fund some of this, so, so uh, a couple of things. One, data manager, I, I personally don't love that term because I don't know what that means. And if that person is just like, writing your Excel spreadsheet, that's not somebody you would employ. Uh, most places have some sort of quality improvement within the department. So you got to know who it is and what they bring. Uh, every cancer center has registrars, which job is, you know, whose job is to collect data and they'll be great to, um, glad to share it with you. Um, in terms of uh, kind of methodological and biostatistical support, somebody on your team if you're doing health services research should be facile with at least concepts uh, and then you do what methodological help and um, some departments uh, have been fortunate to have their own biostatistician on faculty that's a methodological kind of superstar that's very challenging to find and um, uh, kind of when I was thinking about how to put this program together uh, a little bit at UVA when, and made a few phone calls, it turns out most people just pay people in some way and partner with either PHS or whatever you, you know, however you want to call it, bad statisticians, method, methodology, the MPH school, but borrow their time. Um, and even there, there are a lot of challenges because I can't remember in whose talk it was, maybe in Susan's, but it's all about the person who you're going to partner with. And if you, you know, don't have the right person helping you, you're not going to be successful. So you have to vet the people if you have a chance to upfront. But even there, currently, that um, specialty is also so stressed that they don't have enough experts in their own field. And they are, uh, you have to bargain for their time. And um, uh, there, there are challenges there. And But typically departments, you know, in, in bigger academic programs should be um, helping you navigate um, by statistical methodological help. If I can just add one more thing, I, I, I echo the philanthropy thing. And I think becoming a good fundraiser is a great skill. I, I think also, don't don't lose sight of the opportunity to to secure more resources from your institution. You know, I mean, what what all of us do, what all the people in the audience do is kind of superhuman. I mean, to take care of complex HPB patients and still have a productive research career is is really, really extraordinary. And I and I think that institutions take it for granted. And we have to be good, better at communicating that to our chairs, to our chief academic officers, to our hospital presidents, and they will listen. I think, you know, I, I recently, I am negotiating a retention package now, and I asked for a lot of money in, in research, in a research package, and I haven't signed yet, but I think I'm going to get it. And, and the reason is because they know how many residents we train. They know that without our program, our department doesn't produce the pro high profile research that gets done. And they do value that. Maybe not on their monthly PL statement, but when they sit back and think about it, they do value that. And they know that what we're doing is a bargain, no matter how much we ask for, but you really need to ask for it. I think I cannot emphasize this enough. 
if you don't ask for it, you won't get it. Plain and simple. And I think, you know, as uh, we train residents and fellows, you know, I think the one thing we do a poor job of is how to negotiate for themselves, you know, and I think uh, that's uh, should be another area of focus, you know, when we are training, uh, uh, you know, our trainees. Having said that, I think, you know, switching gears and, you know, I think Susan mentioned it, Mustafa mentioned it, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I would love to get an opinion of it, uh, the panel regarding, I just feel like there are some exceptional surgeon scientists, and I'm alluding to ones who are in the lab, but for most, I think we have good question, but we need to collaborate. And Susan and most of our both are to it. I think this field is evolving that we can't be, you know, successful uh, in doing everything, especially in lab. And I feel like the most viable option is to the partnership. So uh, Dr. Hughes, Jordan, Susan, Mustafa, and anybody else on the panel, if you can comment on it. I think Alex, you have partnered with basic scientists as well. Uh, if you guys can comment on that. Can I make a comment? Oh, go first. Go ahead. Susan, oh. I, are there two Susans? I think there are. <laughs> go ahead, Susan. Okay. Um, I, I would just say, um, you know, I think the paradigm has always been like, you always hear bench to bedside research. Again, I think there's nothing wrong with thinking about um, bedside to bench research. Um, and I think there's an opportunity there to kind of take very novel observations and then bring them back and find collaborators um, to help understand, you know, the, the biology behind that. Um, I have to say I've been very fortunate uh, to work with Jen Jen Ye. Um, and so I think between what we do with clinical trials and what she does you know, scientifically, it's been a great partnership. Um, but I, you know, I, I hope, I hope more surgeons can support more surgeons. I guess I would say that because I think um, that's been one of the most productive collaborations I've had, primarily because it is a clinician and it is a surgeon who wants to lift up other surgeons. I, you know, I think Susan, you brings a really important point. I think all of us live in our own silos, but I think it's right now. The time is now for us to collaborate and work together. Michelle, you know, and I were talking about it, you know, the field is evolving and we need to partner because these experiments are super expensive. The bioinformatics is really expensive. Clinical trials are expensive. And I think uh, the partnerships are key. And I think we see some of the, uh, you know, uh, I think what Mike Litsky is doing and collaborating with other groups regarding pump. I know we are tired of hearing about pumps, but I think this is important. When we partner together, we become a force and we can change the paradigm. So uh, I think, you know, in research, we need to collaborate as well. And uh, uh, move forward, Susan. Well, thank you. One thing I wanted to say before we move on forward is that um, these were fabulous talks, and I really want to thank all the speakers. Um, really, um, your your message was clear and was so important. I think you should write this up, put your talks together, and write this up and publish it because the word has to get out there. The second thing I'd like to say about collaboration, I think it's really important to have mutual benefit because if you have a mentor that is just, it's a one-sided situation where they're giving you advice and supporting you, but you're not helping them, no matter how experienced they are, I think it's really important for it to be mutually beneficial. And I think it, for me, it was, I, I'm mostly in, I have a, a lab, but I also do clinical research. But I met someone within the first six months of my arrival to OHSU, um, and um, I was giving a presentation about immunologic tolerance in a rat model of heart and kidney transplant and small bowel transplant. And his postdoc was at the talk. This was in Spain. She happened to be at the presentation when we got back. She called me and said, can you meet my mentor? I think we can collaborate. He was a virologist working on cytomegalovirus. And we have collaborated now for 28 years. And I had an R01 within two years of being a faculty member. I was lucky, but I see it as it wasn't me. It was the collaboration 
with a scientist that was, I was able to give him a model, an animal model, and then uh, he was able to mentor me and we've had a, a robust collaboration ever since. And, it, and you can't do it on your own. So whether it's collaborating with other surgeons, I get that, but I think surgeons are busy and you can add to a scientist some of the things that they don't understand in terms of how the science is clinically applicable to your patients. So I just wanna emphasize, it has to be mutually beneficial in, in terms of your collaborations and your mentors. Please. I'm sure you have a, a list of questions. Um, I, I need I just help. I wanted to uh, thank everyone for uh, a great session. I've been on this committee for, I think this is my fourth year, uh, and I really enjoyed this morning. Great talks from people who are living uh, the dream that we've all aspired to 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 um, to have. Um, I, I guess my question um, is really for the senior people in this room, and whether it's the panelists or anybody else. I think for you know Mickey and Adil and Alex and myself and Bart and I see Josh. There's a lot of junior people um, in this room that are on this meteoric trajectory in their careers, people doing really great things. And I think with that, um, I think we're all starting to get um, asked to do more, um, not like increase volume or whatever, but it's the request of, can you come give grand rounds here? Can you come give a talk here? Can you come to this conference? And what I struggle with is, um, you know, you'll get invited to something in like now that's scheduled for October. So oh, I don't have anything else in October. That sounds great. And then in like six weeks, there'll be something else that comes up and it's a better offer. It's a more interesting uh, request to say, okay, I, I can do that too. And the closer you get, these things start to pile up. Uh, and before you know it, you have so many commitments in a given month that you actually can't get your real work done. So for the people who have been experiencing this for the last couple of decades, um, how do you prioritize those requests as your career evolves so that you don't um, just get too distracted from what's actually important to you and to your patients? I'll, I'll be happy to start. Um... Well, first of all, I, I, I'm referring you, I'm going by memory, but I, I, I think Tim Ferriss in his book, Tribe of Mentors, he asked 100 exceptional people um, six, the same six questions. And I think one of them was, how do, you, how do you say no? And hearing people's different approach to that is really enlightening. So I, I, I'll refer you to, to that, that book and, and some of his podcasts on that. Um, Dr. Cameron uh would say frequently um that it's it's incumbent upon academic surgeons to really make a name for themselves at home you know and first first and and nationally internationally second there's some people you know and i say that as we're all away from home right now but there's some people that flip that on its head and they do fine but um, but I've really taken that to heart myself. So you know, I actually in my and I would say I'm I'm almost unique in this respect in in this community in that I I really never became very involved in national societies. I was uh, very intently uh, and intensively focused on my program at home, uh, particularly my research program. So it's a decision that I made. Um, and I think when you do that, you know, the flip side, the, 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 um, the, the, the negative is if you, if you do that, then people won't ask you to do those things and that's good or bad, but, um, you know, you can get yourself into a real trap when you start saying yes, because then everybody realizes they can count on you. So I would say, um, if you really want to, um, not be beleaguered by that conundrum, then um, then really just start saying no. And, and you can do it in a very polite way. Um, you can say that right now I'm really focused on, uh, on the, the things that I'm working on. 
in my lab program and I just don't have the bandwidth right now to do it, but please, you know, feel free to, to ask me in the future. I have a little different take on that. So, um, uh, it, I, I try to do as much as uh, uh, saying yes to outside programs and doing grand rounds and things like that as possible, because I think it increases my value at home. Um, I think if you're doing, a, especially for the clinical track surgeons doing, you know, research, um, you can do a lot, but nobody at home often doesn't know about it. The only time they hear about it is from other people. And I've seen that in our experience. Um, the more national recognition we get, then the hospital starts paying attention and then we start getting more resources. So it's been a little different, but I think it's a little different track. Um, but uh, but I totally agree that it does. Uh, I mean, things get planned a lot in advance and when the time comes close, Sometimes there are other things that come up and then it's really awkward to try to reschedule. I would just add, thank you. Um, if you need to say no, you should probably thank them and say you're honored for the invitation. Also provide someone else to fill your spot. And I think that's probably the most important avenue. Again, if you're gonna say no, and you've already said yes, find a really good replacement. Um, and then they will be happy, the, the people who invited you, because they don't have to scramble themselves. And so I think if you can always keep in mind, uh, if you're gonna say no, find someone that's really exceptional to take your place, and they may be better at it than you, but I think that's important. Go ahead, introduce yourself. and. Uh, thank you for sharing your wisdoms. Um, my name is Ujin Choi. I'm a trainee from University of Toronto under the Surgeon Scientist Training Program. <clears throat> I just have uh, two um, advice to ask. Uh, one is, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. How do you successfully transition, let's say, in the first three years uh, if you're hired as a surgeon scientist? I think we all agree that we just don't want to be competent surgeons, but also exceptional and uh, inevitably we'll be um, losing some time in the operating room compared to other colleagues who's operating. So that's one question. And second is, uh, uh, I agree that everybody um, is willing to collaborate, but as a PhD student right now, I'm finding more and more difficult to sign papers, uh, share data. And in fact, the hospital administrations are actually moving against us. It's becoming hard to do. Uh, is is there a role for us to change this, or do we uh, just accept it is what it is? I can uh, start with the first uh, question. I think uh, when my mentors used to tell me that you know when you're starting off, um, uh, focus on the research and you know and uh, uh, to build a research program for yourself, you know. But it's uh, such an uh, uh, difficult situation because you just come out of a fellowship and fellowships are really uh, not the reality in a sense that, you know, you're operating a ton, you're doing these big cases. So when you start a new job, you want to do continue with the same thing, but your practice is really slow. And it's like you are f f getting frustrated that, hey, I need to build a clinical practice, you know, and then you're diverting all your attention towards that. And the problem comes in that once your clinical practice takes off, it's really difficult to rein it back in. So I think if you have the opportunity of protected time, funds to build a lab and stuff, focus on that, you know, this is the best time you're getting your paycheck and you are not obligated to have the work our view targets and stuff initially, uh, use it to, uh, you know, the best of uh, your ability at that time. Dr. Hughes. Yeah, two thoughts on that. Um, what I tell my folks is the plant gardens that'll take five years to grow, plant a garden or two a year, and you will be the most successful academic surgeon ever. And then the second thing I'll tell you early in your career, do the work yourself. I think uh, as you train, you are surrounded by people who have done that and now have people, they now become ideas and mentors and supporters. And I think the the other mistake people make is they try to get something done in six months and anything that can be done in six months ain't that great. So, you know, think big, do big, 
and do it yourself for a while and, and don't expect um, mentees and, and, and soldiers or whatever you want to call them to be at your side for at least three to five years. And those would be my two keys for you as you embark on your career. Are you doing bench research or clinical research? Clinical research. I mean, I think it's true for clinical research too, but particularly for those trainees who are interested in bench research is um, you really want to be at an institution and have bosses who believe in what you're doing and are going to support and protect you, especially for basic scientists where it's so time intensive. Um, I, I, I don't think it can be done in the present environment unless you have a... Uh, a, a mentor and a, and a supervisor who um, understands the value in that you're not going to be earning your salary um, and, uh, and gives you that runway. Dr. Sai and then Dr. Or Orlov. Um, <clears throat> so, I, you know, I think um, from the clinical perspective, too, um, it's helpful if you have really good relationships with your partners um, and that they're committed to you because, understandably, you know, that volume outcome relationship, that's that's pretty real. So um, spend some time in the operating room with your partners, watch how they do cases. And then I think if your volumes are low, you can say, hey, can I can I start your Whipple for you? Um, and, you know, if you have some meetings, you can schedule them. I'll, I'll do as much as the cases you feel comfortable with me doing, and then you can come in and do the reconstruction or vice versa. They need time too. So I think um, once you have a good relationship with them, there's an opportunity to capitalize on your senior mentors' volumes as well. Did anybody address your, what I'm perceiving to be a data use agreement question? Is that what you had a question about data use agreements? Uh, that's a big issue. So the answer there is typically start very early because you know they're going to take three, six, nine months. So if you're thinking of collaborating uh, officially with other centers, uh, put your protocol in and make, you can share the protocol with other centers without a data use agreement, but then put it in at all institutions as soon as you know it's going to happen to officially get the data in six months. But I think those... Uh, as Dr. Hughes said, six months is not a long time. So if you're really trying to do something good, uh, it, it's worth doing it that way. I think uh, with that, we'll close this uh, session. Um, terrific talks from all the speakers. Oh, Mustafa, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm glad um, this issue about the data use agreement was brought up. I think the... Um, you know, I mentioned that in my talk also. I, I don't think it gets emphasized because it's not as glamorous as the, as, as the rest of the, um, you know, talking points in, in this session. But I think really um, as surgeon scientists, especially dealing with biorepositories and, and IRBs and IACUCs, I think you really have to know your institutional procedures because if you don't know that, they will keep coming back at you with revisions and that's going to significantly delay um, any progress you're going to make. You know, if you have a great project, you can't send samples to a different institution, that project is dead on arrival. You will not get it done and somebody else will publish ahead of you. So I think you really need to know um, all these mundane things that pertain to regulatory. And I don't think we touched enough on intellectual property. I think that's another aspect you need to talk to your um, uh, institution's OTL office to see when you can file patents because that will that is what's going to sustain you in terms of um, getting future funding and licensing out your technology and also um, leveraging um, your assets to the institution. Very quick question, Nigel Jameson from Glasgow, I'm a surgeon scientist, uh, thanks, for a great session. Just following up maybe in one of Stephen's points about industry uh, support, is in terms of going forward as a surgeon scientist, industry engagement, I'm getting approached by a lot of corporations and asking for support in terms of clinical samples for method development, biotech companies, AI companies. Is there a way of maintaining integrity in that situation? Just thoughts on that. Um, 
interest is intrinsically a good thing. If you don't have a conflict of interest, you're probably not doing really meaningful work. Um, uh, uh, hiding a potential conflict of interest is a real problem. So I, I, I embrace my faculty getting me into these kind of pickles, and then we can openly talk about them in the sunshine, and then it's all okay. I think with that, uh, we'll uh, close this session. I really thank all the speakers and the panelists for their you know, perspective and uh, uh, valuable advice. So thank you so much.